Well, Grady, thank you for joining me today on infamousorders.com. And the first question I want to ask you, you've been writing for a very long time. So how did you get started? What kind of influenced you to write books? Oh, um, you know, I actually was a journalist for a long time before I started writing books. And um, back in 2008, that sort of ended, like the ability to make your living as a freelance journalist just died. And so I kind of doubled down on writing fiction uh, at that point. And it took a while, you know, it took a while to sort of get that up and running. So, um, but that's sort of my background. I, uh, it's, it's given me a few nice advantages. I'm able to hit deadlines and, and yeah. write fast, but um, not always well. So it's got right. disadvantages too. So if any opportunity came about to kind of have somebody adapt one of your novels into a movie, which one would you like to see get adapted into like a TV series or anything live action? Well, uh, they're actually shooting, or I think they just wrapped My Best Friend's Exorcism oh, right that's now. Oh, um, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so I'll be really curious to see what happens with that. Because um, that can be uh, so nostalgic, too, the way you wrote that book. and what, Right. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's it's starring uh, Elsie Fisher, who is uh, the lead in Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade, uh, and she gave a great oh, performance wow. in that, so I'm yeah. really, really curious to see uh, what she does with this. Yeah, and... Uh, I think I saw that you grew up in South Carolina or lived in South Carolina, right? Grew up there, yeah. yeah. I lived there from about the time I was born until I was uh, 18 or 19 years old. Yeah, because that's where my uh, parents' families are from. My dad's from Greenville, oh. and my okay. mom lives in uh, Saluda, South Carolina. Oh, yeah, I know Saluda. Uh, yeah. I've got lots of family up. I've got a lot of family up in the Greenville, Spartanburg area, on my dad's yeah. side of the family. Because uh, we live in Charlotte, North Carolina right now, so we're all mm -hmm. very close. So that's really cool that, you know, you kind of came out from their Carolinas with this, which is really fun for me to read your books. I listen to them on Audible, which I do when I'm at work. I listen to books that way. Mm -hmm. So have you ever listened to like one of your novels on Audible just to kind of see how they perform it? No, you know, I, I really, I'm not an uh, audiobook person, not because I have anything against them, but just I get too distracted. Like I'll start doing something else. If I don't have it in front of me, like reading it, I, I've got my attention spans like a gnat. Um, but I do have a lot of input in um, uh, sort of who the narrators are and things yeah. like that. So, you know, I pushed really hard for, uh, we, I did the heavy metal horror novel, We Sold Our Souls. And um, yeah, that was the narrator. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks. The narrators they were auditioning were fine, but they were all very young women and they didn't have a lot of character in their voices. And so they got really tired of me, but finally came up with uh, <laughs> Carol Monda, who did. I mean, she sounds like she eats hot gravel. She's got a great voice. Right. She has a um, kind of a spunky personality to her almost when she narrates it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, Bonnie Turpin is, I think, a phenomenal narrator. I've heard samples of her stuff here and there. And um, I really pushed hard for her to do Southern Book Club. Um, and when's this interview coming out? When are you going to post this? Uh, as soon as I can, pretty much. Okay. So, yeah, no, because yeah. I was next week we're going to announce the person doing the audiobook for Final Girl Support Group, which I'm really excited about. I'm I have to hold looking that forward to that week. book, too, because that yeah. sounds really fun. And that's the next question I wanted to ask you, because you have all these fun genre themes in your book. How did this one come about? Because this really seems just like a fun homage to the genre of uh, books or films of any kind knowing final girl support groups so this had to be really fun putting this all together yeah um so this actually funnily enough was a title before it was a book that's the same with my best friend's exorcism both that and this i came up with the title and i was like that title's good i gotta use that for something <laughs> um and uh and it just took a really long time for the book to come together for a long time it was, you know, I mean, it's about final girls who are sort of um, the women who survive horror movies. And I always thought, you know, if that really happened, they'd probably be in some kind of support group. And I, you know, you've got Heather Langenkamp who leads the support group in Nightmare on Elm Street 3 for the kids yeah. in that movie. So there's precedent. And you kind of um, got one in a, saw in the final chapter where they had like oh, really? I haven't a seen support that group for like the uh, survivors of Jigsaw. 
And then gosh, they had one in uh, Victor Crowley from the Hatchet series as well, I believe. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I haven't seen the recent uh, Saw movie. But um, yeah, so, and then I figured, you know, well, after a while, people are going to be in that support group saying, why are we still obsessed with something that happened when we were teenagers? And right. uh, they start to die one by one. And so um, it started out sort of as an homage to horror movies and, and books that I loved. And it didn't really come alive to me until I started thinking of the characters as actual people and not as final girls. Is you know, people with lives right. and families beyond just this identity as like they a have survivor. stories of their own and all that yeah. that you had to come up with. Exactly. And for those who haven't read it, one of my favorite pieces of art by you is uh, Paperback from Hell. Oh, thank you. And I think that's kind of like a must read for anybody that's trying to get into horror or genre books, looking for like names or authors to find. So how did you like compile that list that people should seek out? Yeah, well, you know, I was originally just sort of writing these articles for tour um, that were just sort of going into paperback swap shops and reading the books that were there in the horror section. I mean, in a very random haphazard fashion, I was picking them out by cover and if they sounded interesting. And my editor at Quirk uh, had said, you know, I don't know if we'd ever buy it, but if you ever want to write a pitch to see if you could write a book that's like those columns, I'd, I'd read it at least, you know, I, I don't know if we'd publish it, but <laughs> right. I'd be interested. And so I worked with Will Erickson, who does a blog called Too Much Horror Fiction. And Will and I um, sort of talked for, for a few weeks to figure out if there's a story here, you know, or is it just a bunch of covers or is there a story? And we were fortunate that there was a story that sort of these books kind of came out of nowhere between 1967 and 1971 with The Exorcist and a book uh, by Thomas Tryon called The Other and uh, Rosemary's Baby. And then they like boomed all through the 70s and 80s and then died out in the early 90s in, in this sort of wave of, of really graphic serial killer books. And so honestly, it would be a much harder book to write now because I only had about 10 months to write it because I was on contract for two other right. books. And so I um, I had to read a couple of hundred books and oh. write about them in that time. And, and Will really knew the material too, which is an enormous help. But I, so there were some things I had to give short shrift to just because I didn't know enough about it, like YA horror and um, the splatter punk movement. Uh, now I've read a lot more books in those, in those sort of <laughs> parts of the field and so those could be whole chapters on their own so my ignorance turned out to be a, a strong point right and like i'm kind of interested to find other horror authors as well so is there anybody like in your circle you would recommend to me or any of our readers as well if they are looking to get started out in genre books oh sure i mean you know, Michael McDowell is a phenomenal writer, and he's mostly known these days as the guy who wrote the script for Beetlejuice and The Nightmare Before Christmas. But he wrote paperback originals, horror paperback originals in the 70s and 80s, and his stuff's great. The Elementals, which is back in print now, Cold Moon Over Babylon, The Amlet is just insane. Um, so, and he writes very Southern, very local. He grew up in Alabama. And so most of his stuff is, is oh, wow. centered in Southern Alabama and Eastern Alabama um, or, or a little down towards the Gulf. Um, and then uh, Elizabeth Ingstrom, uh, I just helped bring her book When Darkness Loves Us back into print, which is, it's really two novellas, but um, it is really, one of them is really disturbing about under, underground uh, incest monsters and the other is really um a heartbreaker uh about a woman who was born with no nose um those are two that i really love um i'm trying to think of some other really good stuff that's out there right now oh um uh joan sampson's the auctioneer she only ever wrote one book but it's sort of i always describe it as um if cormac mccarthy had written stephen king's needful things um so I think there are a lot of people out there. You just kind of have to poke around a little. Valancourt 
is a company I work with. I don't, they, they don't really pay me, but um, I've worked with them to help bring some of these books back into print. And they specialize in sort of uh, republishing authors who have gone out of print. And so That's if really you browse cool. through their site, they've got a ton of stuff in there. Yeah. And speaking about how you put stuff back into print, how is that process? How does that go? When you bring That's rough. Back into- um, that's a lot of that is James, who's the guy who runs Allen Court. And so basically, Will and James and I will sort of come up with a list of books we'd love to bring back into print. And, and we start with a really long list. And James just goes out looking for the rights. Um, a lot of times, the rights are sort of in a legal limbo um, between, you know, like legally they belong to the authors again, but the publisher insists on them jumping through a lot of paperwork hoops to get the rights back so yeah. that we can publish it. Sometimes that they are out of print, but they're still in print in ebook form, but there's no print version. And we can't do that. We have to have the ebook rights too, so that it makes you know enough money to be worthwhile. Um, and then sometimes we'll find authors who just don't want to do it. They're just not interested in seeing their stuff right. back in print again. Uh, it was a part of their life and it's in the past now. Um, but then if we actually find a book, we look out for every three or four, we go for every four, we go for, we find one. Um, and then we've got to get the text. So we'll have to find a banged up copy of the book that James will scan and then OCR it and then correct that text and then go back over it and copy edit it and do all that. Um, and then we actually try to license the original cover unless the original cover is really bad, in which case we try to license a cover from an artist who also did covers back in the 80s. Um, I usually will, or will, one of us will interview the author or their their, their family if they're, they've passed on and to write an introduction that sort of gives some context right. about the author's life and everything. And then we put them out and hope they sell. Are there any, or has there been one that you couldn't really get back in print that you really wanted to? Oh yeah. Um, two that I would love to get back into print. One is Carnosaur by Harry Adam Knight that um, Robert, Roger Corman made into a movie, but the movie has nothing to do with the book. The book is, I think, early 80s, I think. Um, And it is basically Jurassic Park set in England in the countryside instead of on an island. And it is phenomenal. That sounds like a fantastic idea. Yeah, it's very pulpy. It's really over the top. And, you know, there's some gags from Jurassic Park that are in it. And you kind of wonder if if Michael Crichton or anyone had read this book before they wrote Jurassic Park, or if they're just some naturally occurring gags you have with velociraptors and T-Rexes. Um, right. And then the other one is there's a book called Alligator that is fantastic. Like, the book of Jaws is okay. I'm not a huge fan of it. I think the movie of Jaws is phenomenal. The book has a lot of weird subplots about the mafia and all this I stuff. I agree. I was not in, as huge on the book either. Yeah. But Alligator is the book that people think Jaws is. It is a straight up amazing water hunt, uh, sorry, water predator hunting book except being except instead of being set in new england it's set in the florida everglades um it's wild man the author just wasn't interested they just thought it seemed like a pain and they just didn't weren't interested in having it back in print so and i will say actually in alligators um defense um david foster wallace the author uh has named it before as one of his favorite books and and he's not wrong it's a great book david foster wow yeah, and it's a uh, it's pretty phenomenal. I think uh, what was it that movie, The End of the Tour, with the uh, yeah Jason Single was about him, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, Grady, thank you so much for joining me today. If there's yeah, any, of course. If there's anything else you want to add to promote, feel free. No, I was just going to say, you know, the Final Girl Support Group comes out on July 13th, and I'm doing a ton of virtual events and things. You can find all my nonsense at gradyhendricks.com. And um, I will be doing live events starting in September if everything keeps going in the right direction, which I'm really, really excited about. I I miss people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, Grady, have a great weekend and a great 4th of July.